What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. As always, it's your boy Nicholas, and we officially have the first game of the NFL season in the books last night. We saw KC travel to New England, smack them with that L in their house after the banner ceremony. Ah, that must have hurt for you Patriots fans. Felt good as a Falcons fan, I'll tell you that. I tweeted out and I mentioned in my last video what my thoughts were for an in-season content schedule. Now, every Tuesday, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out with uh, a waiver wire sheet. It's gonna be a blog post, it's not gonna be a video. So you guys are gonna have to head to my website to see the waiver wire sheet, which is gonna be a top pickups. Then at some point in the week, I'm going to be doing a podcast with Fantasy Football Advice. It's gonna be their podcast. I don't know if they're uploading it to their YouTube channel or what they're really doing for it, a podcast each week. And then I wanna do my own video, which will include a bunch of different segments. And this is what I was thinking I was gonna do. Basically a, a recap of last week, looking forward to the next week, five to 10 subscriber questions, whether they're comments on the YouTube channel or Twitter questions or emails or anything like that. So I'll hit a few of those go over any big injury news, go over any notable wide receiver versus cornerback matchups that you should know about, and then maybe take a look at some streamers, defenses, tight ends, quarterbacks. I might dabble with some DFS. I'm not really sure how I'm gonna set that up. I might set it up so that if you subscribe to my email list, each week I'll send you out like a my optimal lineup for FanDuel or DraftKings or whatever. Then I'll go into a, a recap of my E-Town Get Down League matchup, as well as a recap of my subscriber league matchup, Locks of the Century. I'm talking about gambling, spreads, over-unders, player props, team props, any of that kind of stuff. I'm gonna pick a few, probably three locks of the century that y'all can bet on and count it for money. If you're really into gambling, you gotta go follow my cousin on Twitter, Swampy underscore Swami. I'll link it down below, but he's a really good capper. If you guys gamble a lot, definitely go check him out. Right now, I wanna get into the game that went on last night. So I know I've talked a lot already, but let's talk Chiefs and Patriots. I got a lot of bullet points just kind of written down here, so I'm gonna run through them. They're, they're probably not gonna make any sense, and they're in like no particular order. I was just writing them down as they came to my head, so bear with me here. Rex Burkhead played on just 10 of 81 snaps for the Patriots. He actually started, but he was out-targeted by James White three to five, and he rushed the same number of times as Chris Hogan did, three times. Now, a lot of people were high on Burkhead. I liked him. I thought he was maybe the safest back in that backfield given what we knew, which was pretty much nothing. But maybe I'm thinking back on it and, you know, they signed him through free agency and a lot of people liked him as a sleeper pick. And maybe the only reason they signed him is because they thought there was no way Mike Gillisley would hit the free agent market, right? And there were so many other running backs on the market that they did not like. And clearly they took a liking to Gillisley over that entire market. So it makes me think that maybe Burkhead was only signed because they didn't see Gillisley kind of hitting the market at that point. So Burkhead's kind of off your radar as a starter this week. Move over to Alex Smith. Possibly the best game of his career last night. 300 and I think it was like 68 yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions. Great stat by Andy Barons. Smith has never had a season. He's been in the league for a long time. I think he was the first overall pick maybe in like 2004, 2005 or something. He has never had a season where he's thrown 300 passing yards twice. So he already got that shit out of the way in week one. Same thing happened last year. If you look back at last year, his week one performance, he had like 363 yards. To start it, didn't have another 300 yard passing game. I looked at his two games coming off his 300 yard games. His next two games, he had a combined 53% completion percentage, averaged 183 passing yards in those two games through a touchdown, zero interceptions. So basically no stats in the next game. That being said though, you gotta look at this as a, as a moving forward piece, right? Smith took four shots downfield. Downfield means 20 yards or longer, right? He hit on three of them. And on those deep shots, he combined for 178 of his passing yards. Last year, going back to 2016, he had 521 deep yards the entire year. So he's a third of the way there already. Now I hit this point a few times throughout the preseason when I was talking about Tyreek Hill, when I was talking about Patrick Mahomes, all offseason training camp and even in the preseason games, you saw it, Alex Smith was taking a lot more shots down the field. So I'm not surprised by how last night's game turned out. He's feeling the heat from Mahomes. You know, you got this guy behind him. Everyone's like, oh, he's got this big cannon arm. He'd match so much better with a Kelsey, with a Tyreek Hill who could take shots down the field. Smith did so all offseason, and now he's doing it in the regular season. So I'm not anointing him like a QB1 or a starter, but he's definitely someone to keep your eye on as a streamer. Because I think his ceiling, while his floor is probably the same as it's always been, not great, still looked at as a game manager, 
His ceiling is definitely taking a bit of a boost with, you know, with his downfield shots now. They get the Eagles next week, who added Ronald Darby, at cornerback. I think the Eagles are going to be a very underrated defense this year. So I'm probably, he's probably not on my radar as a streamer for this week. I will say, though, New England has some serious pass rush issues. We saw Hightower leave the game last night. We weren't sure what it was. Reports came out this morning that it's a minor sprained MCL. So he has 10 days rest. He could be back for week two. It's very possible. But, you know, they lost Ninkovich. Uh, Rivers with the ACL, they gave up on Coney Ealy. Their pass rush is not good, and we saw it last night. Alex Smith had a lot of time. He completed a lot of passes. Now, however good their defensive back is, their secondary is, this could be a defense that you potentially target for streaming quarterbacks going forward. We'll have to see what happens in the coming weeks. But on the other side of the ball for the Chiefs, talking about defensive injuries, we had Eric Berry. Early reports, the Chiefs fear that it is a torn Achilles tendon, which is brutal for Eric Berry. It's brutal for that defense too. On a fantasy note, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I really want to start KC's defense anymore. I mean, good news is Justin Houston looked like the old Justin Houston, but without Berry, that's such a blow to this defense. And now you don't really have to be afraid of starting tight ends against him. You see how good he did against Gronk last night. He absolutely shut Gronk down. Gronk caught two of his four targets, only 33 yards. He did drop a nice touchdown sling by Brady. The ball hit the hit the ground on, on further review, but I'm not worried about Gronk at all. This was his toughest matchup by far that he's going to face throughout the year. He had that drop touchdown. I mean, he's going to bounce back. No no qualms with Gronk. Losing Barry is going to be somewhere that you could exploit in that defense. Back to the Patriots' backfield. Bike to the bike field. I'll be the first to admit, I sat Mike Gillisley in my E-Town Get Down League. I sat him in my Big Money League. I wasn't taking the chance with this backfield, man. I didn't think the game script was going to... I mean, it wasn't good at all, I guess, is, is what this comes down to. I, I didn't think... I thought the Chiefs were a good run defense. I didn't think he would see so many goal line touches. I didn't think they would they would be there. Luckily, I was going against Tom Brady in that same league in a six-point passing touchdown league, so Brady put up like 13 points. And say what you want about Gillisley, right? You could say he didn't look good last night. He got stuffed on short touches, you know, when he needed that first down. He got stuffed a few times, three yards per carry, you know, 15 for 45, and you can't rely on three touchdowns a game. But the thing is, the way the Patriots play in their offense is that he's going to continue to get so many of those opportunities. I think the big question mark was... Is he, in fact, the 100% clear goal line short yardage back? And I think we saw last night that that definitely is the case. And the Patriots are going to have, you know, last night was possibly the worst game script you could have had for, for a guy like Gillisley, right? Still ended up with three touchdowns. They get so many. Brady and them, they I'm sure they practiced this. They had so many pass interference calls on the one-yard line between Gronk, between all their deep shots and stuff, that Gillisley is going to see so many opportunities. And you can easily argue that Blunt is even, as a running back, needs a game script that the Patriots give him way more so than Gillisley even needs that, right? In terms of skill set, talent, just like youth, agility, receiving skills. So the fact that Blunt still ended up with 300 carries last year, was second in the league, only behind Ezekiel Elliott means Gillisley, I'm sure, will see slight drop-off, but around the same number. So he's going to have plenty of opportunity there. 15 carries last night. You prorate that out to 16 games. I can't even do that off the top of my head. 60, 30, 90. That's about 230, 240 carries. And I think that's probably about accurate for what you can expect from Gillisley, along with a million goal line touches. So in my opinion, he's, he's a pretty safe RB2 flex going forward. The other running backs, like I already mentioned, Burkhead, you're staying away from. James White seemed to be the other most concrete running back in this backfield, right? 10 rushes, five targets, three receptions. So he's getting work all over the place. And this offense, as, as it's high powered, you know, they are going to keep feeding away, and he's obviously the preferred pass catching back there, and he's going to be playing. He actually out-snapped Gillisley. I think it was 42 to 24 or something like that. So he's on the field. I mean, the game script obviously depended. They had a lot of time where they were trying to come back and throwing the ball a ton, you know, but it was just at White was on the field for a lot of their plays. So Gillisley and James White are both looking like legitimate starters in most fantasy leagues. White gets a big boost in PPR leagues, of course, Gillisley in standard, but I think in like half point PPR, they're both pretty safe. I would say Gillisley RB2 and White more of a flex play. And we move over to the receivers. Now we were, you know, we were a little questionable on how this would turn out as well. We saw Chris Hogan did not have a good game, right? He caught one of his five targets, only eight yards. He had three rush attempts. I don't know what they were doing. They kept giving him end arounds and shit like that. I don't know. He's like 6'2". He's too big for that shit. Calm down, Bill. The good thing I would say is he led all wide receivers in snaps. He played on 87% of their, their offensive plays. And he did see four targets of 15 yards or more. So he's a big piece of that deep threat in which Tom Brady utilizes a ton, right? Tom Brady threw 10 deep balls last night. Four of them were to Hogan. 
So those opportunities are eventually going to translate into, into yardage and fantasy production. Behind a Hogan snap percentage of 87%, Brandon Cooks played 79% of the snaps, and then Amendola was the next leading wide receiver, only playing in 35% of their snaps. Now, Amendola had a really nice game, right? Six catches, 100 yards. Someone tweeted out last night, it was like, it was like he was in a video game and he kept getting his health lowered. Every time he got hit, it was like, oh my God, Amendola looks like he's dead. He's like at 20% health. You need to find a berry to replenish your energy. That's like Amendola and just getting killed. He eventually left the game with a concussion or he went into the concussion protocol. So if he misses time, that's gonna be a big uptick in targets for a guy like Hogan or a guy like Cooks or even Dwayne Allen. Dwayne Allen didn't do much last night. He would have had a, a nice play on the, on the first play of their game when Brady threw him a nice deep ball down the sideline, but it was not a nice deep ball. It was a bad pass by Brady. Had it been a little better, Allen would have came down with like a 30, 35, 40 yard uh, reception there. Brandon Cooks, Passed the eye test for me for sure. Caught three of eight targets, 88 yards. A nice, not a huge game, not a monster game, but definitely usable game. He drew three penalties by the defense, which again will eventually convert into yards and fantasy production. It's good to see him getting the target. So for me, a good first game for the Patriots in terms of their weapons. The production wasn't there, but it will come in time. I'm not worried at all about, about this offense. Next week, they travel to New Orleans. This should be a shootout. I'm anticipating the over-under to be probably around like 53 to 55 in that range, which is probably going to be the high of the week for any NFL game. But playing in the Dome, you look at Brandon Cooks playing in the Dome versus outside of the Dome. Remember, he played for New Orleans, and he was a monster when they were at home. Five points more per game in half PPR, PPR, all around just much better numbers in the Dome. So I expect a really, really, really big game from Cooks next week, especially if Amendola is out of the lineup. Overall, as a team, like I said, I'm not worried about the Patriots, especially not Brady. What is a little concerning is the amount of time he had in the pocket. He had plays where he was sitting there for like five seconds at a time, and he still ended up completing like 16 of 33 passes or 36 passes, 267 yards, didn't score a single touchdown, didn't throw an interception either. Took 10 shots down the field, like I said, 10 deep balls. It's just things were just not clicking last night. And I'm sure they'll eventually get on a roll and Brady will be fine. I'm not worried at all about Brady. I was looking back at the last five regular season losses that Brady's had. And in the following game, it's not great to be honest with you, but just worth noting, I guess, for you guys. He's averaged 251 passing yards per game and has a combined 11 to two touchdown to interception ratio in the games following a regular season loss. So Brady and that entire offense should absolutely go bonkers next week in, in New Orleans. And then we look at the Chiefs. The obvious bright spot here is Kareem, the dream Hunt. You guys know how big of a fan I was of Hunt entering the season. I talked about him in a couple weeks leading up to the drafts as soon as Spencer Ware got hurt, and he absolutely did not disappoint at all. I also found it really interesting how many people were nervous to start their players against the New England defense. Like the amount of sit start questions I got about Tyreek Hill and Kareem Hunt was almost like alarming because people were acting as if this New England defense was such a terrible matchup. Like it was Denver in 2015 and you can't play any of your fantasy players. I'm not sure what gave people that impression. And I'm not just saying this like hindsight is 2020. It's easy for me to say this now because I would say for like the 95% of the sit start questions I got, leading up to this game that involved Hunt and Hill. I told you to play them. I, I, for the most part, I'm sorry if I told, if for some reason there was a, a case where I didn't say play Hunter Hill, but for me, I don't know why people were so scared of this New England defense to begin with. It's not like they're elite or anything like that, but just going forward, you know, it's not a matchup you necessarily have to stay away from. Anyways, back to Hunt. He absolutely tore up this defense, right? 17 carries, 148 rushing yards, a touchdown, but the big money came through the air, where he caught five passes for 98 yards and two more touchdowns. It's an absolute, you know, 45 fantasy points, I think, in, in half-point PPR. Might be one of the, it might be the top performing running back performance of this entire fantasy season, to be honest with you. Everything just looked so good from Hunt. He looked incredible. Tied for third uh, on the team in targets as well, behind Kelsey and Hill. I'm sure that's an equation that we'll see a ton this year. And I think the, the big takeaway here is, I tweeted this out last night too, the reason that's, that some people, the people that were off Hunt and didn't like Hunt coming into the season is the reason that it backfired against them. They didn't like him because of his measurables. He's not the fastest flashiest or strongest running back. But you don't need that to be a successful running back, especially in, in for fantasy purposes. His vision and his balance are what makes him such a great running back and what's made him such a good prospect. And that's exactly what we saw last night. 
Tons of times, you know, he found his way through a little hole in the slide. He'd get hit by a linebacker, hit by a safety, bounce off and continue going. That's exactly what I kind of touted, saying that that's the reason why he would be such a good fit here. He's not going to break away. There was, there was another breakaway that he had down the left sideline. He could have went for an extra 40 yards and a touchdown had he had like 4-3, 4-4 speed. He doesn't, and that's, I guess, something that you could, you could take away from him. But everything else adds up perfectly for him to absolutely dominate in this offense. What's more interesting to me is the fact that he only played in 55% of the team's snaps. Chuck Andrick West played on 35% of their snaps. But... Chark Andrew West only had one carry. He was, you know, no one, no one, no running back had more than one carry on their team. So the snaps might be a little different, but it's just like Chark Andrew West is in there maybe for, for pass blocking purposes. While Kareem Hunt's going to be the one that touches all, the ball all the time. So I would say, you know, if you're, if you're a Kareem Hunt owner, I wouldn't, you know, the worst thing in the world wouldn't be to handcuff him with Chark Andrew West. I, I'm not one that usually talks about handcuffing. I don't really like it because it's so unclear most backfields. But I think we got a pretty clear picture of how it's going to work out in this backfield. If Kareem Hunt were to go down, I'm sure it would be very, very, very heavily pushed towards Charkandrick West, the workload there. So if you're a Hunt owner, Charkandrick West is probably someone um, that you could definitely get on the wire. You probably have no trouble grabbing him. The other bright spot, obviously, is Terry Kill here. Another guy that you know I love. Led the team in targets. He had eight of them. Went off for seven catches, 133 yards, and that long touchdown of 75 yards, of course. Now, I know a lot of you people who are against Hill are going to say, Oh, well, it was busted coverage. He needs the big plays to do good, whatever, yada, 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 yada. But we saw time and again last night, he got seven of his eight targets. And besides that one big play, he was tearing up the Patriots defense over the middle, on slants, on crosses, on outs. I'm telling you, this guy is a premier route runner. And if they're going to keep giving him, if they're going to let him lead the team in targets over and over again, he is going to keep producing. And yeah, those big plays, just because you think he relies on them doesn't mean he's not going to keep getting them because he is. He has Olympic speed. I don't know if you guys saw that on the thing. Like his high school 100-yard dash time, he would have finished like fifth or sixth in the Olympics last year. And that's from high school. I think you're underestimating how technically sound this guy is and how fast he is. You could take away that 75-yard bomb. He's still putting up 12 uh, PPR fantasy points for you. It's not like you had to draft him at pick 25 or 30. He played in 75% of the snaps last night. That was his career high. He never played in above 70% last year. So you're seeing the usage that he's going to have this year. He left the game. He like limped off the field. He just had cramps in his thigh. So 10 days rest, he'll be absolutely fine. Not worried about him or his injury. And I just, I don't know, the big plays for me, it's just a reminder that at any point, Tyree Kill has that capability to get you those 13 fantasy points in a matter of five seconds. He'll you're my boy. And last guy to touch on here is Travis Kelsey, the other tight end that struggled in this game. Caught five of his seven targets for 40 yards. Also ran the ball once or a couple times. I don't know what they were doing there. I really like this Casey offense this year, man. A lot of firepower, and I really like what they're doing here. Now, all the reports leading up to this game were the Patriots were targeting in on Travis Kelsey, and that's who they were going to kind of take out of the game plan. And it makes sense. I tweeted this uh, a couple days ago, too. I said I was nervous about Kelsey this year. Think about it. They game, like you can game plan. Imagine they tried to game plan against Tyree Kill. Who on their team would they be able to use Tyree Kill as in practice? No one. No one has that raw talent capability. When you look at Travis Kelsey, they have Rob Gronkowski. Their first team defense can game plan against Gronk as if he's Kelsey. The same player, same skill set, same talent. So for me, that was kind of a red flag, knowing that they had a guy like Gronk to practice against already to take Kelsey out of the game. And that's exactly what, what really happened. They didn't force the ball to him. Still, like, not a terrible PPR fantasy game, five for 40. But you could see every time he went across the middle, they had double coverage on him, especially near the end zone and in, in the red zone. They were not letting him go one-on-one -on -one coverage with a linebacker. They had two guys on him at all times, so I'm not surprised at all by this kind of dud of a performance. Kelsey's still atop of the uh, the tight end rank, not number one, but he's still in like the top, you know, top tier of tight ends. For me, not worried at all about this performance. Expected it more so. Unfortunately, they, they go to Philly, and Philly's a tough matchup for tight ends. They allowed the second fewest fantasy points to tight ends last year. But I mean, I'm not gonna sit Kelsey because of that. I just probably, I mean, if you're a DFS player, I wouldn't expect a huge bounce back by Kelsey next week. And that wraps up my takes from the first Thursday Night Football game, basically. If you enjoyed that, roll down a little bit, give it a thumbs up. I want to just touch on some other random points, I guess, for the week. Uh, maybe some must starts or maybe some deeper kind of guys. We'll start with the wide receivers. Larry Fitzgerald absolutely needs to be in your lineup. Go against Detroit, who lets up like the most slot receiver points in fantasy. Quandre Diggs is garbage at defending slot receivers. Darius Slay does not 
man the slot at all as a cornerback, so Fitzgerald will have easy matchups all year. You know how hot he always starts his seasons off. Fitz is the monster over the first six weeks of the season, so Fitzgerald is going to be dynamite in week one. I really like Jamison Crowder as well. I think he's going to put up the most fantasy points at receiver for Washington. He gets a really nice <coughs> matchup against Patrick Robinson, who mans the slot for Philly. Garbage cornerback as well. Kelvin Benjamin. I'm getting a lot of sit starts about Kelvin Benjamin. I would definitely try to get him in your lineup. I think Cam's going to come back with a vengeance. I think, you know, I, I think this has a possibility of being uh, a shootout. And it's hard to say San Francisco and shootout in the same sentence. But this offense will be improved in San Fran with Kyle Shanahan. They look good in the preseason. And Kelvin gets a really nice matchup with Rashard Robinson at cornerback. Someone probably to, I would say, keep out of your lineup. I know he's probably far down the depth list. Kevin White, for all everyone trying to get cute and be like he's the wide receiver one. He's going to get tons of targets. There's a good chance he sees a lot of Desmond Trufant. Our defense is going to be very underrated as well this year. I mean, they were good last year, but I don't I don't think people are going to... Ex I think we take a huge leap this year, right? We got Dantari Poe, drafted McKinley with, as our linebacker with our first round pick. Desmond Trufant was injured for much of the year last year. So we get healthy pieces back for agency, draft first round pick. Our defense is going to be very, very, very good. And Kevin White's going to have a lot of Robert Alford, a lot of Desmond Trufant which are both tough matchups. So even if Kevin White gets 10 targets, I wouldn't be surprised if he caught like four of them for 35 yards or something like that. So Kevin White is definitely someone I'm staying away from. Golden Tate's probably another guy I'm staying away from as well. Probably just that Detroit wide receiver group because, you know, Tyron Matthews back. So he's probably going to be manning the slot and Tate's going to see a lot of Matthews. If Tate moves to the outside, he'll probably see a lot of Patrick Peterson. And Marvin Jones will get a lot of Patrick Peterson as well. So I'm, I'm nervous about that Arizona defense when I'm, have an offensive player going against them. So Tate's someone that I'm dropping pretty big time on my rankings this week. Someone I absolutely love is Rashard Matthews, man. I've been hyping him basically all offseason, and I think week one is like the perfect situation. It's like the perfect storm coming together. You have Corey Davis, who, you know, they already said he's not fully healthy. He's only going to be playing in special situations. So Matthews is going to be in on all two wide receiver sets. And then you get this Oakland defense, who is absolute garbage, like really, really, really trash. As well as uh, for Delaney Walker, it's a big upgrade because their linebacking core cannot cover guys. I just like the Titans as a whole. I think it definitely has the potential to be a shootout, but I think each individual skill player has very, very high upside and, and a safe floor as well. Another interesting situation is out in Green Bay. Jordy, Devontae, Cobb playing Seattle. Now, for the most part, we could expect Sherman to stay where he always does, right? On the left side of the field, there's a left cornerback. Jordy ran about 50% of his routes from the right side of the field. So they'll be matched up for a large portion of the snaps that Jordy takes. Cobb is probably going to man the slot again. He'll have Shaquille Griffin. I'm not even sure who that is. I guess he's their new slot cornerback for Seattle. And then Devonta Adams gets Jeremy Lane. Overall, I'm probably staying away from the matchup. If you're a DFS guy, I think like a contrarian play might be, might be good here. Like no one is going to be wanting to play Devonta Adams or Jordy Nelson. So they might actually in retrospect be a good play. Monte Adams has actually performed well against Seattle, probably because Jordy takes up, you know, a lot of Richard Sherman and Devontae gets the second stringer, but it's a tough matchup either way. I'm not very high on most of them. And then we have Des Bryant, who, I mean, I'm starting him in my E-Town Get Down League. I don't want to. I don't know. I don't have a logical explanation for starting him. I don't know. I just, I'm going to start Des and, and hope he has a, a decent, I, I hope he can get me 10 points, half point PPR. And he get OBJ to play too. I could be in for a bad week this week. Who else we got? I'll read down Roto World for a minute. Cam Newton's fully listed, good to go. Odell's questionable, officially questionable. Not surprised. He's basically 50-50. It sucks because he's a Sunday night game, so hopefully we have clarification by Sunday morning. But have a backup plan in place. Bengals RB coach said they'll use a hot hand approach. If that's the case, Joe Mixon will certainly have the hot hand most of the time. Again, I'm not comfortable really starting Hill or Mixon this year. I think they're both low floor guys, medium ceilings. Hill might score a touchdown or two, but that's a very, very stiff run defense that Baltimore has. So if I'm starting one of the two, it would be Mixon because he's obviously a much better pass catcher, but I'm not confident starting either of them as anything more than like an RB3 at the, at the most or flex. That's really all I got for you. Actually, let me get some lines for you. Let me get some locks of the century for you. Let me look at some of these bad boys. NFL, NFL prop. Call me crazy, but the Jets has nine point dogs. I, I might roll with the Jets this weekend. Let me take a look at some other games. I like the under in Atlanta and Chicago at 48 and a half right now. I think, like I said, the Falcons defense is going to be much improved, and I don't think the Bears offense is going to do shit. And the defense of the Bears is is kind of underrated too. They have a really, really, really nice front seven. I think my locks would be the Jets plus nine, the under 48 and a half on the Falcons Bears, and my Titans minus, what kind of line is this? What is this? 
Titans minus two and a half. My locks of the century. Let's look at some player prop bets just for fun. We'll mess around here. <laughs> Antonio Brown, excessive celebration penalty over under one and a half. They got McCaffrey's over under for touchdowns is seven. Under is the heavy favorite there. And then they have McCaffrey, total yards 1,000, and over is a, is a heavy favorite there. And that's basically what I said in, in my Panthers write-up. I said I think he goes under seven touchdowns, but over 1,000 total yards. Newton's over-under for touchdowns is 23.5. Palmer's is 25.5. Wentz's is 22.5. Breeze's is 35.5. Jared Goff's is 17.5. That's nice. Le'Veon Bell's total yards over-under is about 1,725. Actually, the over is a heavy... No, it's actually 1,950. David Johnson's is... 1850 with a he with a heavy uh, favorite on the over there. Fournette right here. Over under six and a half touchdowns. The heavy favorite to be under. Rushing yards over under 900. The favorite to be over. But like I don't see a lot of upside there. All right, I'm done here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you have questions for week one, guys, I'm gonna say this shit once. And I'm gonna say it one time. If you're asking me for advice on your lineup, it means that you respect my opinion, right? So there's gonna be a a lot of times where I give you the wrong player, right? I picked the wrong guy. Y'all are grown ass men. You can make your decisions. So if you get mad at me for telling you the wrong player, don't fucking ask me the question then, all right? If you want to bitch at me on social media about something I did wrong, actually, I honestly won't really care. It won't phase me at all, but I'll probably laugh at a lot of the comments that you guys give, but you get the point. Y'all have the decisions to make. You want my opinion? I will say in all those replies, I would start player X or Y, right? I'm not going to tell you who to start, but I'm saying what I would do in that position. So I don't want to hear y'all yelling at me for any sit-star questions because you're asking me because you respect my opinion. So respect my answer when I do it. All right, I'm done. I'm pissed off now. Peace.